quadratic residues. And that's the technical term. We will come to understand it. What that means is congruence classes that have square roots. That's, if you like, a, a correct definition of that term. So a quadratic residue is a congruence class that has a square root. Okay. But um, we'll begin this morning by returning to some basic ideas that you have from your mathematical education uh, already. So what did I say? Some basic ideas, yeah. I'm not quite sure. So when did you first see the quadratic formula for solving your quadratic equation? That, in, that was part of GCSEs, wasn't it? Solving Solving quadratic equations, yeah. And the minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac formula. Okay, well, I'd just like to go back to that. Um, and we just want to have another look at that carefully. Um, so what are the solutions to, to this kind of thing? ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero where x is ranging over, say, the real numbers, let's say. Um, OK, so that's a quadratic equation. And I hope that everybody knows the formula for it. There's a formula that tells you what the, tells you what the solutions are. Um, but let's just let's derive the formula again. Some people call it the minus b formula. What you call it? The quadratic, quadratic formula, I guess. Now, the first thing we do is just to, to make the algebra kind of fall out nicer on the page is we multiply both sides by uh, 4a. I'm also going to assume I'm also going to assume here that a is non-zero. I mean, if, if a happened to be zero, it wouldn't really be a proper quadratic. It would be just a x plus c equals zero. Okay, so I'm going to assume that a is not zero. And I'm going to multiply both sides by 4a. And the effect that that has is to turn the first term into 4a squared x squared plus 4abx plus 4ac equals, and of course you still have zero on the right hand side. Okay, zero times 4a yeah, is um, zero, of course. So that's multiplying by 4a. And of course, it's it's if and only if. So it's the first equation is true if and only if this equation is true. And that's because multiplying both sides by 4a is a reversible procedure. A is non-zero. So you can multiply both sides by a, and you can divide both sides by a. Okay. So if the first equation is true, this one is true. And vice versa, if the second equation is true, if you've got an x that solves this, well, you simply divide both sides by 4a. 0 divided by 4a, whatever it is, 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 is 0. Divide the left-hand side by 4a, get back to this. So those two equations are exactly equivalent. They have exactly the same um, solutions. Well, of course, the reason we did that was to, to make the algebra turn out nicer. Because what that means is this first term here, you really the, the first term is your square term. But now it's very, the whole thing, it, you can easily see that the whole thing is the square of something. It's the square of 2ax, okay? And we can exploit that to get a handle on moving towards a solution. I mean, the kind of solution we want is, a, is an equation where x equals blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we have to isolate x, make x the subject of the whole thing. That's hard at the moment because x is spread into two different terms. Um, and one is squared and the other isn't, so there's no immediate way to, to kind of deal with that, to just reduce it to a single x. But once you have this first term expressed as an exact square, we can do that then, you see, because we can do this completing the square type operation. So we're going to write this as the square of a linear factor containing x. 
the bit containing x has to be 2ax, because that will give you your 4a squared. And what are we going to put here? Well, we're going to put here the bit that's going to generate some x's. And you look over here, and you see we have 4abx. So whatever we put here is going to multiply 2ax. I'm going to have to double it, because you're squaring it. So it's going to be 2 times this times this to get 4abx. So what I need to be is this, this second term to be b. Because we make that b, and when you square the whole thing, you get 4abx. Of course, squaring this also generates a b squared, and there ain't no b squared up there. Okay? So in order to keep things exactly the same, you've got to immediately subtract your b squared. There isn't a b squared. And we haven't accounted for our 4ac yet, so we better put our plus 4ac. So I'm hoping you've seen this argument before. It's lost in the fog of time, or maybe you actually saw it step by step. It's, it's definitely useful to see, and definitely it's going to inform our talk in a moment about the congruence classes. Is everybody okay on that step? Getting to that. Fine. So it's just a symbolic algebraic rewriting of the left-hand side. Yeah. It's a good thing. Now, I, you could say it needlessly complicates the left-hand side. It was simpler before. Yeah, maybe. But the advantage here is now there's only a single x. Whereas before, we had x squared and x. Now there's just a single quantity x. So that, that means we'll be able to home, home in on that x and make it the subject of the equation, which will give us our solution. But, so you start moving towards a solution of this. Uh, so you got 2ax plus b all squared. Put all the other stuff over the other side. b squared minus 4ac. So this is where the discriminant arises from. See it there. Um, and then you that's true if and only if 2ax plus b is the square root b squared minus 4ac. And then you can go through. Stick the minus b over the other side and divide both sides by 2a. That's our great quadratic formula. Now, I zip through those last few steps a little bit quickly. I, sh I should have made a comment or some justification or some explanation on the way there in those last few steps. What, what, what have I left out? Yeah. And the plus or minus. Yeah, the plus. Sorry. The, yeah, the plus or minus. So I've only got plus here. So yeah, you're right. The correct formula has a minus because there isn't only one square root. There's two square roots. There's a positive version and a negative. Okay, that's good. There's one more thing that you know we really need to complete that. Logically, it's not correct at the moment. That if and only it's all the way down. So I'm saying all of these statements are equivalent to one another. X is equal to zero. You know, the polynomial evaluated at X is equal to zero. So on. Remember, I've asked for X to be in the real numbers at the top. So is that okay in all circumstances? Is what I'm saying there okay in all circumstances? No. So what's the problem? Um, if 4ac is bigger than b squared, then you've got a minus. Yeah, so a negative number. So I, I've declared at the top here I'm talking about real numbers x, whether or not there are real numbers x that solve this. And, and you're right, the, the occasions where the discriminant is negative, this step is just nonsense, right? There are no real square roots of negative quantities. Of course, we know that we've invented a larger, more abstract number system called the complex numbers that provide those quantities. But if we're just focusing on the real numbers, this, this statement needs a, a proviso, provided b squared minus 4ac Well, let's just say for the moment, has a square root. Because that's the issue. It, does that quantity have a square root or does it not? Okay. I.e., provided we, we, we understand for the real numbers, the numbers that have square roots are all the non negative ones. 
zero has a square root, zero, and every positive number has a square root. The calculator can give us an approximation too. Okay, there are formulas that will give you a converging sequence of uh, estimates converging to the square root. You've been doing that yet in the numerical methods with norm? Things converging to square roots, algorithms for it. Newton's method or something. Newton's method for root finding. Have you done that? Maybe. Or maybe it's coming up soon. Maybe it's coming up soon. Um, so positive, non-negative real numbers have square roots. Negative numbers don't. So this chain of reasoning is fine, provided b squared minus four is is is, uh, is non-negative. If b squared minus 4ac was less than zero, the conclusion is that the polynomial has no real solutions. And why is, that, why is that statement true? That statement is true because, you see, if you go back to this line here, this line here, we said the original equation was equivalent to this statement. This statement is saying, that b squared minus 4ac has a square root, because there's a thing in the bracket. You square it, you get b squared minus 4ac. So if b squared minus 4ac is negative, you understand it has no square roots. Therefore, there, there can't be an x existing that satisfies this equation. So if b squared minus 4ac is negative, we infer it doesn't have a square root. So you can't put anything in this bracket here, any real number, such that when you square it, you get b squared minus so there can't be, there can't exist a real number that can go in this bracket and make this equation work. Because if it could, um, we'd be violating the fact that b squared minus 4ac is negative. So if there's, no, if there's no real number at all that can go in this bracket, that means there can't exist this a. So if the x existed that satisfied this, then it would make this real number 2ax plus b. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, um, that's the story about the quadratic formula. So hopefully that made you give you fond memories of school mathematics. Um, the thing I want to emphasize here is just this notion of having a square root. So I want to take the focus, of, I want to get you thinking more that it's not to do with whether the discriminant is positive or negative. It's to do with whether the discriminant has a square root. That's the, that's the, slight change of focus I, I, I would want you to make. So if b squared minus 4ac is negative, i.e. b squared minus 4ac has no real square roots. So I just want you to adopt that way. Crucial thing, because we're engaged in, well, you'll see when we start to try and repeat this argument for congresses. Crucial thing is not whether something is positive or negative, but it's, it's this notion of having a square root. Once you enlarge your view and you build the system of complex numbers, where you've got the imaginary number i, which is a square root of a negative quantity, then suddenly you don't need all this. When, when, if, if x is a complex number, then you just remove all these provisos and, and the whole thing goes through okay, because every number has a square root when you're operating in the universal complex okay. So there's none of these uh, provisos needed when x is complex. Any questions about that part or any queries about any fond memories of earlier maths or no? I quite like it. It's a nice little proof. It's something to... It's, it's people often I think almost every math student, engineering student, physics student will remember what the formula is. Not many people will, not many people apart from mathematicians will remember how to prove it or how to, how to justify it. Uh, for other people, it's just some weird arrangement of the coefficients that works, but there is a definite proof. Um, okay. Okay, but we're in the middle, we're doing our number theory, we're studying the behavior of modular arithmetic. How the congruence classes of integers behave under the under under their arithmetic operations. Okay. So we'll turn now turn now to 
a quadratic congruence. So not a quadratic equation, but a quadratic congruence. Modulo of prime. So are there so what we're asking is are there solutions? Are there solutions x to ax squared plus bx plus c congruent to zero modulo p? This question. Now where is x? What is x? What's the universe for x? What, 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 instead of the real numbers, what am I talking about? Well, we're talking about congruence, congruence relation, so this has to be an integer over here. So yeah, we're, we're considering x being an integer. But we already know that if you're considering a situation modulo p, if x is a number that solves that equation, so will anything else in the same congruence class as x modulo p. Proved a series of exercises that led up to that result. Take two things that are congruent, modulo n. When you evaluate a polynomial at them, they probably give you different answers, different integer answers, but they'll give you answers that are in the same congruence class as each other, modulo to modulo. So really what we're considering x is, we're considering all the x's in the integer, in the congruence, in the set of congruence classes of integers, modulo. Because if one integer x solves this, so will every other integer in the same congruence class. So really that this the solutions I want to talk about is which congruence classes. Or if you like, i.e., you can think of x being one of these standard representatives of those congruence classes. P of them, 0, 1, 3 to P of So how to solve this? Well, a tempting thing to do is just to repeat the same analysis. Yeah, I mean, it worked for equations. Let's see if it'll work for, for, um, for these. Okay, so, well, what was the first step? The first step was this kind of neat simplifying trick. We need uh, multiplying both sides by 4a. You don't actually have to do 4a. You can do the completing the square argument straight away. But the thing is, you'll end up with, well, what you'll end up, you'll end up with like a square root of a here or something and halves all over the place. So you, you, you can make it work without, um, without, uh, yeah, but it's just the algebra is a bit more messy. It takes a bit more manipulation. So this multiplying both sides by 4a is a good thing to do. That's the first thing we'd like to do. Multiply both sides of this by 4a, which would give us 4a squared, x squared plus 4abx plus 4ac, so far congruent to zero modulo p. But see, now I have to worry a little bit about is, is, is that a justified move? Is saying that this section polynomial is, a, is equivalent, logically equivalent to the first polynomial equals zero, is, is that true? Before, before the consideration was, um, that a had to be non-zero, right? Because going one way, we multiply both sides by 4a. To go back, to, to get the implication in the other way, you have to divide both sides by 4a. And division by a is fine as long as a is non-zero. Well, it's the same thing here. Moving from the first to the second is fine for every situation. We just multiply both sides by 4a, and the top equation will imply the second equation. But if we're going back, if we're going from this equation to the first one, we need to know that we can divide both sides by 4a. Of course, in this context of modular arithmetic, we prefer to say multiply by the, both sides by the inverse. Think of it conceptually as dividing by 4a, but it's better to think of it as multiplying both sides by the inverse of 4a. So we need to know, in, in, in order to claim this logical equivalence, we need to know that the inverse of 4a exists. So this is provided for a inverse exists modulo p, but the inverse of 4a. It's kind of small. Inverse of 4a must exist modulo p. That's to give you 
the implication of the second line implies the first. Now, what conditions might give us that? Well, one simplifying condition is that we're going to assume that we're not talking about the prime two. I mean, not that much goes on, much about the prime two. It's only two congruence classes, zero or one. There's not a hell of a lot of action happening. So, and of course, four is not convertible modulo two. Four is common to zero. Just an inverse for two modulo two. Four modulo two. So I'm going to assume that we're not in the case of the prime two. So that means the prime p is odd. Times bigger than two, they're often called the odd primes. Well, that takes care of the four. Remember, what's the condition for having an inverse? The condition for having an inverse is that you are co-prime to the modulus. You've got to remember that. The basic condition of whether an inverse exists. So four is definitely co-prime to the modulus now, because we've assumed P is an odd number. Every odd number is co-prime to four. Four only has the factor two. Um, so we need to worry about whether A, the inverse of A exists. The inverse of 4 times A will be the inverse of 4 times the inverse of A. So now it's just a question of whether the inverse of A exists. So we need to assume more or less that that's the case. So I an extra assume. We also want to assume that um, GCD of A and P is 1. So that A is an inverse much of P. Now P is a prime number. So a better way, or the, the more customary way of saying that the GCD of A and P is 1 is a kind of more direct way of saying that P only has two devices to share, one in itself. And this is saying the only thing it shares with A is 1. So i.e., that's the same as saying that P does not divide A. So A is not a multiple of P. And that makes sense now, just now. Because if A was a multiple of P, that would mean A would be congruent to zero modulo. So this original, what I claim to be a quadratic congruence, wouldn't really be a quadratic congruence. Because if A was zero modulo P, it would just be the X plus C. It wouldn't really be something like that. So for any number of reasons, um, we require that P does not divide A, or for these two reasons. For it to be a genuine quadratic, and also we need to be able to make this logical for that, we need to be able to divide both sides by 4a, multiply both sides by the inverse of 4a to get back to 1. Is that okay? Pretty happy with that. So a solution exists, if and only if a solution exists to this second one. And there, then you can do the same, um, exactly the same, completing the square type move. It just happens for congruence classes as well as regular integers. Same algebraic move. And that then tells us that this thing squared is equal, is congruent to b squared minus 4ac. So you have the same discriminant expression. And now we want to do our square, taking the square root of both sides, except It's kind of rude to use the square root sign in modular arithmetic. It's just not good. It's just against the custom. Okay. So we're going to say that this thing squared is congruent to this thing, if and only if this thing is congruent to a u modulo p such that u squared is congruent to b squared minus 4ac. And this is good because this, so u is in effect the square root, the square root minus 4ac. It's something, sorry, uh, no, sorry, I want to say d squared, of course. So u, you think of as the square root, the square root minus 4ac. Except we don't have the square root symbol in much of it. Kind of belongs to the real 
arithmetic world in a way. Um, so this argument is the same thing. And this, this, this has the benefit that it, it emphasizes the fact, it emphasizes the question of does the square root exist or not? Does such a u exist? So what I'm saying is, 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 is the middle line here is equivalent to this line, provided it, a, u, so a u can be found such that u has this property, u squared minus 4. So this immediately raises questions. You see, when we introduced square roots for the real numbers, we knew the story about square roots of real numbers. Positive ones had square roots. Non-negative ones had square roots. Negative ones didn't. So we had a clear picture of how square roots work when we introduced them in our argument for the quadratic equations. Here, we haven't, we haven't really mentioned square roots in modular arithmetic up to now. So, um, oh, that's still wrong. No, so I don't need, was, were you yeah. querying the square? Yeah, yeah, no, I don't need the new. If, if I put the, do you want to say, rather than just. <laughs> so I was trying to figure it out. Yeah, 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 no, no, oh, yeah. you were right. You were right. I was <laughs> getting confused. Yeah, the square, yeah. The 2ax plus b has to be congruent to the u. The u squared is congruent to b squared minus 4ac, if it exists, but then the 2ax plus b must be congruent to the u. Sorry for confusing me. I confused myself first. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's correct. So this line is true if and only if a u can be found, which is congruent to 2ax plus b, or the 2ax plus b is congruent to the u, and u has this property that when you square it, you get b squared minus 4 ac yeah, u is representing the square root of the square root of the But two immediate questions arise. Does such a u exist? The u, of course, is coming from the same universe. u is supposed to be an, a congruence class. Does such a u exist? And what's the second question after that? Yeah, that'd be the third question. Maybe. Ah. Does such a U exist, and how many of them are there? Maybe. And then, how do we find? It? Yes. How many are there? If any exist, how many exist? Mm -hmm. Question three. Yeah. How do we find them? How do we find real square roots for quadratic equations? Well, there are. Convergent. There are algorithms that give you estimates of square roots, and you run the algorithm, and it improves and improves the estimate, and makes the estimate converge to the true value. So finding square roots in real arithmetic is kind of a solved problem. In a good way, we understand how the square roots operate, and there are very fast convergent algorithms that converge to do any estimates of any accuracy you want of square roots of inputs, provided you can represent the input accurately as well. Um, but these questions, we haven't addressed any of these questions so far in the module. So provided such a mu exists, we can make this equivalent statement. And then that would be, but once you know such a mu, uh, a u exists, then you can do the usual thing. Uh, it, the solution is going to be u or let's say minus b plus mu divided by 2a, except we won't write a fraction with 2a underneath it, of course, we write multiplied by 2a in this copy. 2a we know is invertible from the assumptions we've made already. We assume that both a and 4, no, same applies to 2, both a and 2 are co prime to prime b. So there's our solutions. This is the quadratic formula. This is the quadratic formula for congruences. For the quadratic congruences. So it raises these questions. If we, have, if we get a good understanding of these questions, 
Kelly could claim to have a good understanding of when quadratics have solutions modulo p. Because the algebra runs fine, I mean, but you know, you, you can't say this is the solution for the formulas, or you can't say it with much confidence when we don't even know if these u's can be found. Do they always exist? Does every number have a square root in the system ZP? Do any numbers have square roots? Is there, is there any systematic behavior for the different primes? P3, P4, P plus 4, P5, P plus 3, P plus 5, 7. For all the different primes, is there any kind of systematic behavior amongst which numbers are squares? Which numbers have square roots? Uh, much both. Is it to do with, so for question one, is it to do with positive and negative? Is it that simple? Do the positive ones have square roots and the negative ones don't? Never mentioned up to now any notion of a positive element or a negative element of ZP. Remember, every every congruence class, every congruence class mod P has positive and negative, positive and negative integer elements. Remember, every congruence class is, is an infinite set of integers. You take one representative and just add multiples of p to it, you get other representatives of the congruence class, and subtract multiples of p, you get other representatives of the congruence class. So every congruence class has an infinite number of integers, half of them, if you like, are positive, half of them are negative. So what is... We, we don't have to hand such a thing as a positive element or a negative element yet. We will do, I don't know, just an informal way of saying it. Kind of, that is a don't know and Vino, my kids are reading. Actually, the question flips, and once we have a good understanding of which numbers have square roots, those are the ones we will call positive ones. And the ones that don't have square roots, those are the ones we're going to call the negative ones. So the answer to this question completely flips. It's not that the answer to does the, does the square root exist is discovering which ones are the positive or negative ones. It's once we discover which ones, are the, which ones have square roots, which ones don't, that will tell us which ones to regard as being positive elements and which ones to regard as being negative elements. So, a number of different questions and no apparent answers. That's a good strategy. We could flick ahead in the pages in the notes. So, if, if we've got some several kind of hard questions and just no kind of feeling for what the answer is yet. We should we should have a look on the ground. Okay. Look at some examples. Okay. Let's go with I mean it's a bit of a boring example, but p equals three. Three congruence classes. Zero, one, two. Eh, which of them have square roots? The, for which of these is there something that when you square it, you get modulo 3? Well, if I square 0, I get 0. Yeah. If I square 1, I get 1. Square 2, I get... Which is I'm going to one. Yeah, so I get so I get one. 
Now there's nothing else to look at, okay? Everything else modulo three lines up behind one of these three and it squares in the same way in, in terms of the congruence class that it goes to. Okay? Now zero will always turn out to be something which has a square root. We're not really that interested in zero. It's really the non-zero ones we're interested in. One will always turn out to have a square root. One squared is always one. The other numbers that are kind of interesting. So two does not have a square root. One does. Modulo three. We go to modulo five, the next prime. That's zero, one, two, three, four. See the way we're finding the, the numbers that have square roots um, by squaring everything, just seeing where it goes. That's a natural way to find the, find the numbers that have square roots is to square things and see where they go. So again, zero, so, so this map here now is the squaring map. Yeah. So zero goes to zero. I'll write out all the options here. One, when you square it, goes to one. Two, when you square it, goes to four. Three, when you square it, goes to four. Yeah, it goes to nine. Modulo five is four, so three goes to four. Four goes to one. Four squared is 16, which is one. Another way to think of four is a negative one. Four is congruent to negative one mod five. When you square negative one, you, of course, get one. So what do we see here? Two and three are not residues, but one and four are. Let's do two more. What the next two primes, seven and 11? Oh, 11 might be hard. So what happens mod seven? Quickly, zero goes to zero as it does, one goes to one, two is still going to four, three is going to nine, which is two. Uh, yeah, because you know, maybe we thought two was never a, never had square roots. But now mod seven, you see three, uh, two does have square roots. Four squared is 16, which is, uh, well that's two again. Yeah. Five squared is 25, which is four. And six, well, that's going to go back to one. So the ones, let's bring the ones that are, do have square roots. Can we do 11 in a couple of minutes? There's going to be arrows all over the place here. But two goes to four. What else is going to go to four? If you start thinking a bit more logically about this, Two goes to four, minus two will go to four as well. Where's minus two? That's two is nine, isn't it? Nine modulo 11. But once we discover that two squared is four, we should immediately fill in minus two. Uh, three squared is nine. So minus three will go to nine as well, which is eight. Eight is 64. Eight squared is 64, which is nine bigger than Eight squared is 64, which is nine bigger than a multiple of 11. Yeah, 55. Right. Um, four squared is 16, which modulo 11 is five, isn't it? Four squared is 16, modulo 11 is five. Yeah, so four squares to five. So minus four should square to five as well, which is seven. Uh, five squared is 25. 
3, isn't it? Three mod 11. 22 plus 3. And my brain really slows down. 6, which is minus 5, that'll have to go to the same thing. Uh, so let's join 6 onto arrow, coming out of 5. And 10 is minus 1, so it's going to come all the way back here to 1. So let's ring the ones with, which do have square roots. 3 had square roots. The second arrow was just joining onto the first. 4 had square roots, 5 had square roots, and 9 had square roots. So that's our first look at it. Um, any conjectures? <coughs> just, just from this. So the, the purpose of this chapter is to study the phenomenon of when things have square roots and when they don't. It's already kind of a bit perplexing, or it's, it's already good in the fact that we're seeing some interesting things. Sometimes two is doesn't have square roots, sometimes it does. Sometimes three has square roots, sometimes it doesn't. Four always has a square root. Why is that? In just these few examples. Why does four always have a square root? Everybody knows the answer to it. Why does four always have a square root? Because two squared is four. Two squared is four. Yeah. Four is already a square integer. And it retains that property when you look at the congruence class containing four modulo any. Right? Because whatever two is, when you square it, you're going to get four. And that's a similar, okay, we're C9 here has a as a square root, but yeah, of course it does, because it's the square of three. And one always has a square root because it's the square of one in the regular integer sense. So the interesting ones here, which we only start to see a few of them because we're only in the early, in the early uh, small primes, but the fact that two has a square root here, five and three, that's interesting. They don't, because they're not square integers in the room. If they didn't already have this square possessing a square root property naturally. But you can see they have it in these congruence classes, much like these primes. One thing that is consistent, is there anything that is consistent there that you can see? How many of them are there? There's always, there's always exactly half. Half, half. If we ignore zero, then half of them have square roots, half of them don't. This is one and one, two and two, three and three, four and four. That's maybe our first strong. Why are you saying five? Ah, no. Uh, why are you saying five? No, five and five, sorry. Yeah. Five and five, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, five and five in the last case. So amongst the non zero, Congress classes, there seems to be a half and half split. So maybe that's that's one conjecture we could be saying. So in now I'll attach the multiplication sign because that's what we're talking about is the multiplicative group of congruence classes, modulo P, congruence classes from one to P minus one. There, there are P minus one over two having square roots. And P minus one over two not having square roots. Okay, and I better finish now. But we'll just finish by this is basically the introduce the terminology. These are called quadratic residues. The residue is the stuff left behind, the sticky stuff left behind by something. So a quadratic residue is the stuff left behind after you square something. You square something and it leaves behind a residue as the result of the process. So those are the ones that have square roots. They come from an operation of squaring something. The ones not having square roots are called quadratic non-residues. Modulo P. Modulo P is always tagged on to this you're, you're considering some particular crime. 
So it raises questions. They they do seem to exist some of the time. Half the time they seem, you know, but half the cases are do have square roots, half them don't. That's what it looks like. So that's something we're going to think about. We're going to try and prove. Um, the question is, how do you find them? Well, you can find them like this by just squaring everything. Is there any other systematic way to find them? If I give you a large prime and a certain integer, like is 5 a quadratic residue modulo, give me large prime 101? Is 5 a quadratic residue modulo 101? Does 5 have a square root? We can discover pretty quickly if it does by doing this squaring everything up. Is there any other systematic way you can somehow examine the situation? Are there any other tools, methods, is there any other structure that will tell us whether 5 is a square root modulo 101? Those kinds of questions are, are raised by these investigations. Those are the kind of ones we'll be investigating. All right, sorry, I've got you a bit too long. I'll stop there.